welcome everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Paul. It's uh, so good to be back in studio. I, I do prefer working with you here in studio rather than remotely in my office because the sound, no matter what we do, the sound doesn't come out quite quite as good. And me choosing a place with people is odd coming from an introvert. But I think, I think I'm beginning to think I'm only a partial in, introvert because I still enjoy live conversations with interesting people. And interesting certainly describes our guest today. I have known Haley Chapman for longer than 15 years. Isn't that right, Haley? It's got to be 15 years. Yeah, it has to be. That sounds about right. Yeah. From and when we first met in the <laughs> baseball world. In the baseball world. And you were like 9 or 10 years old, I'm guessing. Does that sound right? Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> and in the meantime, you've grown up to be uh, uh, an impressive, enthusiastic young woman with unique talents, and most challenging dreams. Now, I want to read your bio that says, Haley Chapman is a young entertainment industry professional living in Los Angeles, California. Most recently, she has worked as a publicist at multiple records, record studios, television and film production studios, in, including Dick Clark Productions. Haley is also, and, and th- this is an area of interest, is also a most, most gifted singer-songwriter, having released her first EP at 18 years old. She attended Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee, where she received her degree in music, business, and entertainment industry studies. I am keenly interested in chatting with Haley about the challenging and ultra-competitive journey of a brilliant and creative artist. So with that... Let's bring Haley Chapman onto the show. Haley, welcome to the next chapter with Charlie. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is exciting. I'm really glad that you reached out. I've never done anything like this before. Well, not a, a lot of people haven't. And so, you know, the fun thing about this show is it really is conversational. It's not, you know, you don't have to come prepared uh, I don't even send you notes on the show. You're just sitting there wondering, what is he going to talk to me about? And <laughs> and, and so it, it really is, it's dynamic, and the conversation emerges, and and so it makes it a lot of fun. We, you know, we talked last week on the show about this being jazz and about where we, we have sort of a direction, but there's a lot of improvisation, on, like, like in jazz musicians, and I... I love going into the unknown and into improvisation, so I'm certain we will hit some of that. Now, I have to say, for me, it's so fun to watch a vibrant young girl like yourself grow into an adult and become an even more vibrant and uh, adult, and especially when you bring such enviable talent into our world. Now, Now you mentioned it earlier, but for our listeners' information, your dad and I coached a youth baseball team, and you were one of the young sisters that I say were condemned to watching your brother and his friends play baseball forever. I, I can't imagine how painful that was. Yeah, it's a big part of my, I would say, from like nine until, I don't know, maybe like 13 or so those years were spent at baseball fields um, with the other sisters of the boys that were playing. And I would say it was a kind of, I was kind of held captive for those years. You, there wasn't really a way around it, but you know, we, we got through it. <laughs> did the other girls feel the same way? I think so. I think we just didn't know any anything different, but I will say <laughs> that my uh, my brother did end up getting dragged to some of my cheer competitions, so we're kind of even. Oh, good. So he <laughs> had to. So he had to pay his dues. But your cheer competitions, oh, yeah. I know. Now I forgot that you were in cheer. You were really quite successful in cheer, were you not? 
I, yeah, I, I kind of, that was another thing with, I kind of had to balance it with music. It was like a choice that I had to make in high school, which was how much time do I want to spend on music? How much time do I want to spend on cheer? Because that was very important to me. I was a competitive cheerleader for like five years, five or six years, um, and ended up not doing it in college or anything. So really going towards my music goal when I turned 18. So through through high school, I kind of was a cheerleader and did music as well. It kind of it was a balancing act for a while. But that I can see that competitive nature because I I you know I don't know if your mom is competitive, but I know your dad is. You know, having <laughs> coached with him is ultra competitive. And oh, yeah. So so I'm sure he he cheered you on in your competition in cheer. That's kind of a oh yeah. Redundant he he use loved of words. that stuff. He loved. He would always be the dad that was like videoing the whole thing and then would like show it back to me later and and it, say what, what he liked about it what was so cool and yeah he and then he plays softball now and he like with his friends and even that he's <laughs> so competitive and but maybe i get it from him <laughs> yeah i you know what when your dad and i were talking when we talked about having you on the show i did not realize your dad was so much younger than me. I looked at him as peer all that time, and and we are like seventeen years difference. Your dad is like seventeen. Really? Yeah, you you know who knows what I was doing at seventeen when he was born? Who knows what kind of hell raising I was into, and it, the year that he was born? He, I, I had no idea we had that kind of difference. He's he's fifty four. I'm seventy one. So. Wow, I didn't realize that. You didn't realize I was such an old fart? No. Age is, age is but a number. We know this. <laughs> well, it's, it's a number, but it has, it has physical ramifications. Although, you know, honestly, Haley, I think, I think I am entering into the best phase of my life ever. I just, I mean, I'm healthy. I, I eat well. My weight is contained and, and oh, I'm doing wonderful things with my life, so I'm, 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 I'm very, I'm very pleased. Um, That's also the thing I was thinking about before this too, about how it's kind of there's really no timeline on on your life, especially you know being in my mid twenties. I always thought you know, as you go through your twenties and you get to the end of your twenties, you need to have X Y Z done by this date and. It's just not true. You can start a podcast when you're in your 70s. You can you can continue pursuing your dreams forever. And it's hard to understand that until you're actually like there, but until you're old. Yeah, you don't you don't get it, you know. <laughs> there's there's an old saying that education is wasted on the young, that the young don't quite mm. you know that that the older appreciate it and 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 there are a lot of false goals that are set on you that are culturally set on you that i mean you yeah. have a loving wonderful family but you know you have parental designs that are that are set on you that that become part of you and then part of your growth is is an unlearning process don't you think 100% it's all about creating your own sort of timeline and expectations for yourself and kind of dismantling the the expectations that the world kind of puts on young people and or anyone of any age honestly I feel like we all just put this pressure on ourselves to achieve everything that we want to achieve before we you know hit a certain age and it's it's all made up <laughs> none of it is real and none of it is really going to define your entire life, you know. You kind of just got to go after what what you want, even if it doesn't happen at the exact time that you wanted it to. Now, see, I understand but. that with with growing older, but you know what I don't understand is at your age, at such a young age, how do you begin to define what is that core you that authentic integrity you you know living according to your own personal integrity 
as opposed to what you've been taught. How, how do you go about discovering who the who the true you is inside? Have you created some kind of process or some kind of thinking or things you've done? It's, it's trial and error, I think. It's, it's going after what you want, but the second that it doesn't go your way, it's adapting and it's understanding that if a door doesn't open for you, it's, that's not your door. And there's always a time for, there's always time to pursue your dreams. Like it's, it's not, there's not a cutoff age. And I feel like, especially this year in 2020, I don't really think it went the way anybody planned. (laughs) So it really was a year of trying to understand that nothing really ever goes as planned but the way that things turn out is the way that they were supposed to happen. And you kind of just have to adapt to it, I think, because there were a lot of a lot of things I kind of expected to happen by the age that I'm at, and, and it didn't go exactly the way that I thought it would, and that's okay, you know? We're adapting to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, we're going to talk about adapting and... and, and... You know, and there's a there's this this fine line between adapt and adaptation and perseverance. You know, sometimes it's the appropriate thing to persevere, and sometimes it's there's a time to say this is complete. It's time to move on, and it's yeah. and those are very 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 difficult decisions. And you know, I don't want to keep referring to you as so young, but I'm just I'm always impressed impressed at the wisdom of the youth. That you, you know, I was when I when I was your age, I was a hellraiser, and I was not thinking of anything about wisdom of life but partying. That was, you know, the, <laughs> my wisest thing was what party is available and and who's going and what girls are going to attend. That was, <laughs> you know, that was the way I spent my twenties. And and you were you were quite quite different. Now I I do want to ask. You know, when, when we were talking about finding that true and core self, you were, were you raised in a culture that had, that, that honored that sort of freedom? Or was there certain expectations of you that were, that you had to, that you had to unlearn? I think I was raised in a way where I was free to kind of do whatever I want. My parents really supported me following my dreams of music and didn't really put that pressure on me of like, go to college, go get a job, get married, blah, blah, blah. They never really put any of that pressure on me, which I'm super thankful for. I think all the pressure that I put is from like myself, like the pressure that I, that I feel to get things done. And for the the plans that I put in place for my life, I feel like I put all that on myself and I think that that's kind of gotten me to where I am, and it kind of, that kind of fuels my ambition. And it's funny, my my brother and I, and then my parents, we all talk about it about how like we're all individually ambitious, and we all kind of put that pressure on ourselves to like get us to where we want to go. So it's it's interesting to think about it that way because I know a lot of people who have parents that are like, you need to do X Y Z and follow these steps and I never really had that, which was nice that I kind of got to figure out my own future and my own timeline on my own account. You so. know, and, and and knowing your parents, I can see that because I can see that certainly in your mom, that your mom yeah. seems to be very strong that way. Your dad may be a little bit more controlling, but he is also, he's also open. You present your dad with a good case, you know, with a good yeah. rationale, and and he's open to think outside the box. That's that's my experience with your dad, anyway. Absolutely, it, you described it perfectly. My dad is exactly like that, and then my mom is is more like she's kind of the the one that's tough on herself and like wants to do really well in everything she does and succeed in everything she does, which is my brother to a T. And then me and my dad are kind of on the side of like well, like figuring it out as we go and not really not really being too hard on ourselves. Oh really? Like, I would never expected your mom and your and your brother more in tune 
than your brother and your dad? They are. It's interesting. It's a different dynamic. I think the perfectionist side is my mom and my brother, and the ambition is is definitely in my dad as well. But I feel like me and my dad are less perfectionist and more kind of like, you'll get there when you get there. Like, just keep working hard and keep your head down, do the work, and you'll end up where you're going eventually or like when it's supposed to happen. And I think my mom and my brother are a little less patient. <laughs> I just got a quote last week from our, our you know, we just had a wonderful guest last week named Lindsay Davis, and she gave a roomy quote that said, you are entitled to your labor, but you are not entitled to the fruits of your labor. The fruits of your labor mm. will come as they may. And w- we always think that if we do this certain labor, then the fruits are, are certain to come. But right. life throws way too many, way too many curves, you know, using a baseball term, but throws too many <laughs> curves at us to, to predict what, what our fruit will be. Now tell me, so, so you're in chair, you're doing really well in chair, and, and your team evidently is a competitive team and probably nationally competitive, I would assume. Yeah, we actually made it to the world competition. So oh complete, like every team in, that made it to the world was, was from obviously all over the globe. And that was, that was kind of the peak. That was where I, I ended my career at the, at the top. <laughs> oh, that's a, this is not a bad place to end, but what I'd like yeah. to talk about is I, I want to talk about, you know, I, I, I probably should want to talk about chair more, but since I've heard you sing and, you know, I had it all planned out that our interlude and our closing were going to be yours, but then we found out copyright, we're not allowed to do it, and so I'm so disappointed. But listeners on the show notes, Haley's EPs will be available, and you will be blown away by this young woman's voice. Tell me, I'd, I'd kind of like to have you bring me up to speed, and I'd like to start with when and how you discovered you were such a gifted singer and songwriter as well, right? Yeah. Um, I, I kind of started in uh, like sixth grade elementary school when I joined choir and got the solo in choir and was super into it, did, did choir as well in, in high school and I don't think, it's kind of a thing that you realize when you start singing in front of other people. Like, it's kind of something that you don't really understand on your own. At least I didn't until I started singing in choir and people would, you know, say like, wow, you're really good. And I would kind of be like, oh, thanks, you know, and keep trying. And I would, I would do the solos and then eventually... I um, found this songwriting sort of academy, if you will, that was in Orange County and basically started going there for to do songwriting and started recording music and obviously just fell in love. It was like heaven on earth <laughs> for me. And I started songwriting and then along came some songs that we really loved and decided that it was time for me to release some music and ended up releasing my first EP through that um, songwriting uh, academy slash record label that was in Orange County. So that's kind of where I decided it was like kind of a real thing. Like I was like, we can actually go for this. We can actually do this and, and pursue a career in music. And then I, then I, obviously I went to college in Nashville for uh, music business. Uh, not for be, not for singing. You went for business, right? So I I eventually I wanted to go for commercial voice and do their their vocal program and everything like that. But at the end of the day, I kind of wanted to be able to walk away from college with some sort of business degree or some you know a bachelor of arts in in something that is a little more, I don't know, just not, not voice, you know? So I eventually fell in love with the business side of it. 
more than I thought I would. And interned at a couple record labels in Nashville during college and eventually made my way into the publicity and marketing field at the record labels and decided to kind of go that route at the moment. It was, it was kind of, I don't know, it was sort of a, you can still pursue music while you're, you know, working on the business side of it, you know, so I... So you I have you have I'm, food on the table while you're a starving mm-hmm. artist. That is also a huge, <laughs> a huge factor as well. But it, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it and eventually moved back after college. I moved back home to Orange County and was interviewing for jobs in L.A. and eventually got my job as a publicist at uh, Dick Clark Productions, where we all, we it's like a live television and um, film production company. So not exactly where I thought I'd end up. Again, <laughs> never really know your plan, but um, stayed. I was there for about two and a half years, and yeah, I loved it. Um, what was the, also what was the attraction thinking. of that over singing? I mean, you know, I know you still you never lost the le- lost the passion for singing. But how did how did business sort of sort of compensate for that passion for biz, for singing? What is yeah, it about I business kinda, that that strikes you that you find you find your you know that you you seem definitely seem to have passion around that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think being in on the business side of it after trying to kind of quote unquote make it as an artist, I really was intrigued about being on an artist team at a label to where you can be a part of them, quote unquote, making it and be, be someone behind the creative process of, of developing a, you know, a launch plan for their single or their album, or just kind of being like understanding how the business works was so eye opening to me. And I really wanted to be a part of that um, creative process and see how how things work behind the scenes. I got to meet a lot of awesome people that really taught me a lot about the business. And I don't know. I think I was just very intrigued because I understood it. Like, I understood how it worked on, on the consumer side and then also how artists' team, they kind of approach their fan base in a different way. And I think it just clicked for me. And I really thought that I would excel there and ended up doing really well and really liking it, but obviously still keeping my passion for music and still recording covers and and writing and posting singing videos and stuff like that. So, Well, I want to come back to the music part, but I, I I want to talk to something because I think you really brought up a very important point that I think is is essential to make clear, and that too often we equate creativity with the arts. If you're creative, mm-hmm. you're either a poet, a painter, a singer, a sculptor, you know, some sort of either performing art or hand hand art, hand hand finger art. You are, but there is a creative side that is that creative management of life mm-hmm. side that you, that, you, you know, I've had so many different careers in life and, and, and I have absolutely no expertise in them. And I like to pardon the expression, but I'm really good at figuring shit out. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it was like when I became a baseball coach, I knew nothing of baseball coaching, but I went to camps, studied baseball, would go to different people, learn baseball, go to high school practices and watched. And, you know, I've got, you know, you know, Haley, I told your dad the other day and he was shocked, but I have seven players that I coach that play big league baseball right now. And, and oh, wow. that play not, not, not professional baseball in the minors, but play in the big leagues. And this came from somebody who knew nothing about baseball, you know, but it was just that yeah. you figure stuff out. And that is, that is a creative angle that people don't think of that creative angle. And you're seeing that in the business side of what you do, are you not? Yeah, absolutely. And it's 
interesting because you're all, it, it's kind of the same thing of learning by just trying and learning by jumping in and faking it till you make it, as I like to call it. And I felt like I kind of did that in my first year at my job, but also when I was putting out music and stuff like that, it's, you kind of just go for it and you figure it out along the way. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes you, sometimes you succeed, but you know, you just learn and you, and you keep going. So I felt the same way in my, in my job and, and when I was first starting music. There is that, there is it, is there not, did you ever face that fraud imposter syndrome that I really, I really oh. don't have it. I'm, I'm a fraud. I'm an imposter here. Absolutely. When I started my first job at right out of college and was at this huge entertainment company, I was like, what am I doing here? Like, <laughs> who did I fool to get this job? Like, how did this happen? And even when my boss and my team would say, like, you're doing such a good job, blah, blah, blah. Like, I started that at that company in a huge, huge role as a publicist at 21 years old, and I had no idea what I was doing, but even when they would say, you know, you're, you're killing it, you're doing, you're doing great, I'm like, no, I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing, but, but I realized that that happens a lot in life, not just in, not just in your job, just in life in general, everything that you try that's new, you just keep going, <laughs> you're, ne- it's never going to be perfect, you Yeah, know? you know, I, I, I think I think an enviable place that I'm now viewing is that fraud or imposter syndrome because what it means is that I don't have my act together because if I'm not a fraud, then I think I'm an expert and there is no such thing as an expert because there's too many variables in life that you have to be able to adjust to. You have to be able to yeah. manage, you have to be able to change, you have to think on the fly. You know, you're... you're your many times I look at my best decisions are made under crisis that, mm-hmm. y- you know, I don't have time to think about it. I just have time to respond. And those are, yep. those are better decisions. And, and some would call that a fraud, but, but I don't think so. What I want to do and, and the direction I'm heading, I think this may be early for a break, but I think I want to take a break now because I kind of want to do a little bit of a direction change. And so I'm so sorry we're not playing your song. We're playing (laughs) mine. So just kind of hold on for a second. We'll be right back. No problem. Hi, this is Charlie Hedges, and you're listening to The Next Chapter with Charlie, and I have a very special guest, Haley Chapman, who is a singer-songwriter, uh, brilliant publicist, uh, who's worked with several record labels, and has done exceedingly well at business, at the same time not giving up on her dreams of being a singer-songwriter. And, and Haley, what I want to do now is I would like to sort of jump into that journey because I know me and most likely my my listeners are really interested in that journey because, you know, it's like like anything, you know, it's like acting, it's like athletics, it's, you know, it's, it's, you can be really, really good, but only the really, really, really good ones (laughs) make it you know it's just it's so difficult it's such a and and many times it's not about your talent because you know i remember the old story and i I probably shouldn't tell this story but it's the old story of you may not remember this guy 20 30 years ago saying tiny bubbles his name was um his name was don ho and there were these um and he was playing in a in hawaii in a dive in hawaii and there was four marketing guys sitting in there and saying, you know what? I could make this piece of crap a millionaire. And they they laughed at him because he was really not that good. But they did. They made him a millionaire on this song, Tiny Bubbles. Everybody in America knew the song. 
And so you don't necessarily have to be talented. You just have to have the right people around you. But that's that's the rare case. So what I want to hear about is your journey. And when we were chatting before the show, you had talked to me that you had tried out at American Idol and other shows. And, you know, inform us of that. What is that like? What is that price process of going through American Idol or America's Got Talent or whatever those? What What is that like? Yeah, it's um, it's very interesting. So when I first, the first show I ever auditioned for was, I believe it was The Voice. So I had a, I had a, um, spe- quote unquote special um, casting sort of audition process because I went straight to the producers round, which was because I went through the record label company I was working with that I, that produced my EP, but I went to the producers round the, the, I luckily got to skip the cattle call step, but I did the cattle call step for American Idol, but you kind of, you sing. Well, wait producers. a minute. Tell me, tell me about the cattle call step because I, I don't, oh. I don't think most of us even know what the cattle call step is. Got it. Okay. So when you, when you sign up to try out for say American Idol, you show up to the venue that they're auditioning everyone at. And it is essentially the longest line you've ever seen that you wait in for. I think we were in our line to check in for probably a couple hours. And then you check in and they give you your number and they put you in a, in a seat in the arena, or at least that's how it worked for Idol. And they put you in in a little seat in groups, and then they'll take each group down one by one. And there are, it look, they look like little voting booths. Like they're all like separated by curtains. And there are different producers in each little mm, like curtain room. <laughs> uh-huh. So, you go in and you sing, you have like three songs prepared and you sing for the producer and then they say yes or no, they hand you a little slip. I was lucky enough to get a yes and I got my slip and went back, I think either it was the next day or the day after and they ask you to come back and you sing a certain song that they give you. They give you um, some, I, I believe they're approved songs uh that have been approved to be on air on on television so you can you practice those and you sing whichever one fits you the best and then they same process over again you you sing for them and it's a a different producer that time and they say yes or no that was the step that i got cut right before the hollywood round or however which whatever it's called now i think it, it still is hollywood round but that's where I was cut right before that step. And then um, the voice process was a little different. Like I said, I went straight to the producer round. I got cut after the producer round for that one as well. But it's a crazy process. They all kind of do it differently. But usually you, you see the producers way before the actual celebrity judges. You You go through multiple rounds before you get to that step unlike what they show on TV, which is just you show up and you go, but there's a lot of steps before that. So, How, it's a and, and what is the time duration of all of that? I, it goes pretty fast. So it's like the, the first audition, at least this is how it worked back when I was, I guess I was like 17 maybe. You, there's probably, I think for me it was like I, went, I auditioned the first day and then they asked me to come back. I think it was the next day or the following day. And then I believe after that, you just keep going. I think it's like a full week of of you go back and forth. And then if you make it to the judges in the Hollywood rounds, then they put you in a hotel. And I think the production schedule is like every day. They just knock it out. They They do Hollywood rounds. And then after that, then you go to live shows. So you so never you didn't do the producers round. You didn't do the Simon Cowhawk or whatever his name is. No, <laughs> no, I I never made it to the like on air celebrity judges um, audition part. I always made it to the 
the last producer's round <laughs> before it. So, so so tell me honestly now this is going to be hard for you to be this candid but how many times were you better than the people that were selected? Hmm. I will be super honest and say probably probably most of the time like I think I, and that's when I hit the cold, hard reality that it's not about talent. Like you were saying earlier, it's really not about the best vocalist or the best songwriter necessarily. You have to have that it factor. You have to have what the industry is missing at that time. So say there's, I think the reason that when I auditioned, I was, I'm like a country singer songwriter at this point it was where I was kind of going for they already had a Taylor Swift, you know, they already had a blonde singer songwriter, Taylor Swift. So there really wasn't a huge gap in the industry that I was needed. And I think that they had an excess of, of, you know, women singers, songwriters in that, in that, in that world. And I think that that was a reason that I was, I didn't make it that far because it's all about timing and about your brand and, and, how they can market you on this television show. and Will you appeal to their audience? And it, that's the issue with shows like that is it's never really about talent. It's all about the TV show. Like at the end of the day, it's a TV show that needs ratings, you know? So it, it's never really purely about necessarily about talent. It's kind of about your brand essentially and who you appeal to. How do the artists now that that you know there's you know there's so many artists in the business you know you know I think in the seventies when I was listening to music in this well the sixties especially there were probably mm-hmm. fifteen groups maybe twenty and that was it you know I mean that was there right. just were no now there's you know now there's fifteen million how how does an artist emerge with you know like like you know use for example and I don't even know if it's a really good example or not but Billie Eilish who is sort of yeah. sort of unique and and how does how does somebody like that ever make it in the industry when they're they're not playing the game they're not doing it the way that the marketing people want you to do it how do they even how do they even I can see how they make it how the how the how the public will like them but how do they get past it so the public can even see them? I think that nowadays social media is huge. And and a lot of times record labels and management companies and all these entertainment companies won't even look at you until you have your own social media built and you have your brand and you have your fans. And it's such a business that I think... I think the way she appeals is because there's really no one else like her and it, she's e- easily distinguishable. And again, I've said this so many times, but like she essentially herself is her own brand and she, she has her own little niche in this pop music world. So I think it's just cause she's very different and not essentially like there's not another one of her out there. What about, what about, you know, there's something, my guess is because I've, you know, I've, I've dabbled in the arts in one way or another, whether it's writing or painting and, and, and I know there is something that's getting expressed that is generally, genuinely out of the core me. And there has Mm -hmm. to come a time For me, because, see, I don't need to make a living at it. I'm a retired man, so I can kind of do whatever I want to do. But that whatever comes out of me, it really almost doesn't make a difference if there's an audience. Because I Mm kind of don't care if there's an audience. I just feel like I have to express this. There's There's a book I want to write. And I know the way you write books now, unless you self publish, which is so common. But if you go with public pub uh publish or publishers, you've got to have an audience, you know, you've got to have twenty thousand people in your 
in your blog list or your post list or your yeah. Facebook list. Because if you don't, they're not going to do, they won't even do marketing. Publishers don't even do right. marketing anymore. They want you to do all the marketing and they're going to set up. So what happens to the artist that truly has something in her heart that mm-hmm. she feels passionate about delivering that she just has to deliver, but there may not at this point, given the state of the industry, not given the state of the public, but the state of the industry, they don't they don't foresee a market for it. What what does what becomes of an artist like that? I don't know. I feel like if you are passionate and you are authentic and honest and you put out good creative music that that people love i think that that you will find that success and you will you will build a fan base or you will have followers that that love what you do it may not be on the scale of billie eilish of course but it's if it's good, you know, people do listen. I, I have a ton of friends like that who are creating and creating. And obviously they, they aren't huge, huge artists, but people listen, you know, and if you just keep creating and doing what you love, I feel like it will resonate with someone out there. You know, it doesn't have to be millions of followers, but I do, I am passionate about people still creating and and doing what they love because people will listen, you know, their music is universal. Yeah. Or whatever. And it doesn't have to be music. It can be whatever they're doing in life. Yeah. That, you know, that that's really, I I love that. Uh, Kevin Rose writer. Did Kevin Rose do, do um, um, wired is Kevin Rose, the, the creator of wired. I don't know. Maybe, but but he talks about uh, 1,000 devoted fans, and that's all anybody needs. If you have 1,000 devoted fans, you, mm. you can do anything you want in the world. That's a, you know, now it can be, it can be fewer than 1,000, but, you know, he, you know, he's working with people that have, that have hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, and even million followers. But he just says it's 1,000 devoted fans that are devoted to what you're doing, to the art that you are producing, to whatever you're creating. How do you feel about that? Do you feel you have something that you would, that you're passionate about that you would like to get out there? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'll never obviously give up on music. And I'm finally now with the world slowed down because of quarantine and everything. I'm getting my passion. I'm finding that I have this urge to get, my creative side back up and running and my friend and I, who we met through music through that uh, Academy that we were at together songwriting and we're going to start a podcast as well. So we're going to, we're just going to keep the creative juices flowing and we just had an urge to do it. And we're like, why not? So I think I'll always continue creating music and I think always I'm a creative at heart (laughs) and I'm sure you can relate but I I think that now is now is the time to get back into that creative mindset after working in the corporate world for a long time. That's incredible. That's 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 really good. And I just as an aside, I want to say I I really encourage you to um, attempt a podcast because you have the personality and the voice. Not every not everybody has that. There are people that want to do podcasts, and I want to tell them. Please don't, you know, it's, <laughs> you, you've, you've got no business, but that's not you. You have, you have the voice, you have the audio presence and, and I think you would do a really good job. There's, there's oh, a, you. um, there's, I don't want to be stealing everything from last week's show, but we talked about something from last week's show and we talked about a quote from Seth Godin that is, that is really impacting the way I'm viewing life. And at 71, I'm still creating and adding new things to my life. My life is not, I'm not, you know, a a stodgy set in his way, 71 year old. I'm kind of a 71 going on 40. Um, 
I just, you know, I have so many things in mind. And have, have you ever heard, there's, there's two different ways of approaching this. There, of a life planning process is that you, you, and I used to encourage this of people, is that imagine if you had no constraints and you were guaranteed success, what would your life look like in the next five to ten years? So, you know, you, you get away from that, um, from the negative voices, from the, we talked about them on the, on the show, Paul, what do we talk about those voices? The, not the negative voices, but the, the preventative voices that keep you from doing things. You get rid of those, and so you'll try anything. So I, I always like that exercise, but Seth Godin framed it exactly in the opposite. He said, what would you do if you knew you were going to fail? Now check this out. What would you do if you knew you were going to fail, but you were so enamored with it and so compelled by it that you had to do it anyway? Mm. Isn't that a great question? Yeah, that's awesome. It's it's scary to think about, but it's very true. Yeah, it's it's scary it's to think true. about when you're young and you got food to put on the table, but when you're retired and you're a kept man because your wife does so well, you can think that way. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yes, I I I agree. I I really like that point of view that he's coming from. Yeah, and that would be, you know, I don't want to play your life coach or anything, but you are so good. You have so much to offer, and it is just, it's a shame to the world that mm-hmm. you are that you are not out with your 1,000 devoted fans or your 10,000 or your 1 million devoted fans because you really are, the listeners have to listen. I'm, I'm going to include a link on the show notes of your songs, and the listeners will see what you have to offer, and you have so much to offer. I um, think. Thank you. Yeah, I think now is the time that I'm going to get my creative juices flowing again, do the podcast, and I will never give up singing. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> well, please do. And if you ever need, if you ever need outside encouragement, give me a shout. Say, Charlie, I'm feeling down. Make me feel good, and 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 <laughs> I'd be happy to do that. Haley, you have been incredible. This is just such a fun and delightful podcast. This is, um, this is, I think, so enlightening and so insightful for so many people. Thank you for spending time with me today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. This was, this was so fun. I'm excited. Now I was like, this is, a, this is a test run, so now I can actually feel comfortable like starting a podcast. Yeah. So it's a nice yeah. little experience. And, um, and, Feel free to contact me, and I can give you some clues on how you start it. P- Producer Paul and I always have ideas of how you start podcast and what are some of the Perfect. what are some of the boundaries and the rules that you want to follow. And I'd be happy to give, yeah. happy to give you feedback on that. Now, would you do you have any any objection if I, I put your email in and listeners wanted to get a hold of you about anything? Is is that okay with you, or is that a private? Oh yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay, I'll be sure to put that in the notes and um and say hi to your say hi to your family for me. Give them my love. Your dad and I talked about uh coming up to your house sometime soon and just and just, you know, yeah. getting in touch again because it's been so many years and we, you know, have always been close as families. It would I be know. nice to get in touch with all of you. Yes, absolutely. You need to come see the house. <laughs> Do I? Yes, it's it's super nice. They did a great job. Um, they pretty much re redid the whole thing. So, yeah, it looks great. You got to come see it. Well, your mom's got such incredible taste that um, she sure does. I'll give it to her. <laughs> yeah, give them my love. And, I will. And thanks will. again for for coming in. And and I also want to thank um, all our listeners for tuning in to the next chapter with Charlie. And please. Uh, be sure to check us out at our website, thenextchapter.life. Uh, tell your friends about us. And until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.